Hey everyone, Adam here, Sub Wizard Podcast. Today I have a movie review for you. Got a chance to check out 1031 Part 2, that would be October 31st, if you're just hearing it phonetically and it doesn't make any sense to you, which is the sequel to a compilation horror movie made back in, I believe the first one was 2017. I hadn't seen the first one, but I didn't think it would matter stepping into the second one because this is kind of done in a, um, almost the grindhouse style where there's individual segments that don't really have much to do with each other. Maybe a couple things cross over or there's some tonal similarities. So 1031 part two kicks off with trailers. Uh, at first I thought the movie just started and it felt like it started in the middle of something where I was thinking that this was tying into 1031 part one and I was going to have to stop the screener, get a copy of 1031 part one to watch that just to be able to watch this long story short trailers. Uh, they were OK, I, I could see what the creators, it's hard to say the creator because there was many directors, many people in the cast, actually a pretty big ensemble put together for an indie project. Kudos to them for that, because I'm sure orchestrating all of that wasn't easy. But the trailers were a little bit all over the place. Uh, I had just mentioned that the Grindhouse thing doesn't have a lot to do except for maybe tonally. Uh, I would feel like if you're doing a compilation kind of storytelling, you'd maybe have at least a loose theme, a loose thing in tone. Some of them were horror. Some of them were horror comedy. Some of them were just kind of the gross out old. Let's get as many buckets of uh, red caro syrup in there as we possibly can. And some were just kind of knockoffs of things that already existed. It was a little bit all over the place. Maybe I'm judging it too harshly, but it was more confusing trying to figure out what was going on than it was enjoying what was happening. As far as these fake trailers go, there there wasn't much to, to speak of. When the movie proper kicks in, they do it with that old style horror host format. And I appreciated that because for some reason there's this huge thing in indie horror and it's probably just what inspired the people so I shouldn't say for some reason but there is an ongoing current theme in indie horror hitting nostalgia uh, most of these old trailers were done to look like they were on old 16 millimeter film or you know maybe an overworn VHS tape there's all sorts of artifacting on the screen to age it down this and that fine uh, I, I don't know why all horror feels the need to do that or all a big chunk of horror finds the need to do that and can't make definitive statements. But it's like comedies now, just the fact that you set your thing in 1990 doesn't make it funnier just because you're doing a horror movie and making it look like it was on a found reel or on a VHS tape doesn't automatically make it better, especially when it's still widescreen, there's cell phones and there's modern cars like do one or the other. If your thing is set in the era of VHS, so you're making it look like it was on VHS and all that, great, but I kind of think you need to be all in, all or nothing. I don't know why you found a worn-out digital stream of something shot in 4K, but it's grainy. When 1031 proper kicks in, they kind of abandon that, they being the creators, abandon that for the most part. There's, you know, filters used for coloring tone, this and that, but the ridiculous amount of trying to age the video is gone it's high def things look good things are in focus things are in frame i appreciated the effort at making it look as good as it could the horror host angle is there in the beginning and the end it doesn't really have any part in between the segments which i think was a little bit of a missed opportunity uh the cool thing about those old schlocky horror hosts was the puns and the uh kind of bad on purpose, low budget feel of it. And that's definitely the tone that 1031 as a whole or 1031 part two as a whole was going for. So I actually think a little bit more time spent on the horror host aspect of it could have made it feel a little bit more like an experience. The things kind of run into each other and there's title treatments and stuff. So, you know, it's a different thing. There's the studio title cards. Great. Uh, the first segment is uh, the quintessential horror movie of babysitting gone wrong. There's a pretty decent twist near the end. I don't want to delve too specifically deep into any one of these in case you do want to see it. I don't want to give everything away from you or giving everything away for you. But it's the, um, you know, girl goes to babysit. It's Halloween night. The parents are going out to a Halloween party. And for some reason, the dad 
of the child who's being babysat is incredibly abrasive, and that never comes up again, so that seemed entirely unnecessary. I think it was supposed to be for laughs. Uh, she bribes the kid with a, um old horror movie, something the kid should definitely not be watching in order for her to have her boyfriend over and the kid not tell his parents. Of course, horribleness goes down. Her night doesn't go as planned. There's some creepy aspects to it, but it feels more silly than scary for the most part. And there's also no... There's no indication when the bad stuff starts happening that it was coming other than that, oh, we're watching a horror movie. These are only like 30 minute long shorts, so I guess they didn't have a ton of time for world building, but I feel like there could have been a hint or two dropped that you knew something horrific was going to come other than the fact that you should be expecting something horrific to come because the movie you're watching is called 1031 Part 2. That is a bit of a common thing I'm going to have to say across all of these, really. So the second short we get in 1031 Part 2 was by far my favorite. It tackles the ride-sharing app thing, which is a huge trend right now. Everyone's using it. And it's also ripe for horror movies, just getting in cars with strangers, of course. I mean, how many hitchhiking movies were there in the 1970s with that very message of don't get in cars with strangers? So you're kind of following this uh, sad sack guy who I think was... He picks up really weird guy. I mean, a guy you'd only pick up because it's Halloween and he's strange. And there's some cool, subtle things done with the effects. I feel like the filmmaker behind this one maybe not had the most talent, but had the best vision for what they were getting across and also how to do more with the little bit that they had. I don't know what the individual budgets for these things were. I didn't look that far into it. Uh, So you're following the sad sack guy around and his wife or girlfriend wants him home. She wants to spend Halloween with him. He knows it's a good night to make some money driving for generic name your ride share app you know insert the blank the main guy wants to he's at least planning to kill himself is the impression you get in the beginning which again credit to the filmmaker there's actually some setup it doesn't just totally come out of nowhere and it becomes something of a be careful what you wish for which i really like in horror movies because there's so much of that going around or kind of the saw thing and let's just go back to like the original saw movie not spiral or saw 73 or whatever we're up to now where once he's faced with the possibility of death, he's afraid and he's not sure he wants it. And the entity staring him down is kind of saying, you know, you wanted this. Why? You know, what makes you say that? And it got to be kind of this cool moral thing. And that gets sidelined a little bit. And the course it takes is interesting and gives her some creepy imagery in the end. And if they just held that line a little tighter, I think it would have been even better. But I really did enjoy the second segment. It was Going into the third segment, I was, you know, feeling a little bit better about what I was getting into because the first one put me off. The trailers before that really put me off. It got to the point in the trailers because there was like 12 minutes of trailers up front before we get to the movie proper. And then getting into the first segment, which was a half hour long, I was like 40 minutes into this thing just kind of checking the time and oh man I got over an hour to go still and that's never a place you want to be with watching a movie especially one that's only 105 minutes long especially when you're watching one of shorts the shorts should make it feel a lot faster so going to the third installment I was feeling a bit better about things and then it was started off as kind of a you know trick-or-treaters being menaced people getting killed in houses which we've seen a million times by Jason Voorhees in all but name. It was an insanely blatant ripoff. And I was like, how are they getting away with this? I mean, I guess you can't really trademark hockey mask machete tall guy, but it was so blatant. I found it more off putting than anything until I saw what they were doing. But the Jason Voorhees character is not supposed to be Jason Voorhees. He's supposed to be a type. And then there are other types of things you've seen, and it's supposed to be familiar. That becomes the entire point, and you realize this slasher ripoff is not a slasher ripoff, but it's kind of a slasher parody pointing out the ridiculousness of the slashers. And I actually really did appreciate what they were going for once I saw what they were going for. Again, there could have been a little bit showing you what they were doing before it exactly got there. 
you know, plant those seeds so maybe you don't catch on before they want the reveal. But so when the reveal comes, you say, oh, those things I saw made sense. All these parts lead up to the whole. It's just kind of one thing. And then, oh, this is what we're doing. Enjoy it. And for the most part, I did. But just that, that little bit more of fine tuning. I'm not even when the fourth segment started, I thought it was going to replace the second one as my favorite. It started off following a nun, which I thought, OK, we're going to get a possession story. We're going to get a um, exorcism story, something along those lines, which we don't. So it was cool that there was a twist. And if you've been watching my videos for any amount of time, you know how many times I repeat that I like it when horror movies deal with real life. Example, the second segment dealt with depression and, you know, suicidal thoughts, mental health, and did that with a horror twist. This one is dealing with grief and loss and regret and kind of gives it a horror twist. And I was fully ready to love this and be totally on board. And the actress <clears throat> playing the nun was... She was possibly the best actress in the whole thing and not bad on the eye, so great there. And it just kind of... It kind of never fully finds its way. Maybe because I don't have the experiences or never had the experiences that the character is dealing with, but it, it was almost there. It was a really, really great attempt and it just didn't quite stick the landing for me. Maybe you have a different opinion... But I do like that they went for something lofty and it wasn't just horror for horror's sake. Oh. 1031 Part 2, <clears throat> if you like the anthology horrors, if you're a horror fan and you know what you're getting into, because I've always believed that horror needs to be graved on a cur graded on a curve, you know, I got more enjoyment out of it than I didn't. The trailers didn't quite work for me. I think if they pared down how many they put in and just picked the strongest ones and peppered them throughout, it would have been better. The person they picked for the horror host I didn't think did a great job as a horror host but it also didn't get a lot of screen time so with some snappy dialogue and maybe a bit more time spent you know in between the segments to do it like the horror host go into commercial break put in one of the trailers you know really crafted that experience that had just taken the ingredients and you know seen what order they stuck in just little edits like that, I think, would have gone a long way. You could have cut the runtime down a little bit. The trailers would have felt stronger if you just picked the best ones. And if you put them throughout the thing with the horror host as buttons, you would have crafted that Friday night. You're a kid at home. You want to watch something scary with the lights off. You could have gotten that feeling a lot more with just some tweaking, really just some repositioning, not even having to reshoot or spend more money or anything like that. So 1031 Part 2 <clears throat> is available now. If you're into horror movies, if you're into horror anthologies, I've definitely seen worse. There was at least two segments that I really liked, the second and the fourth. So if you watch it, keep that in mind. See what you think. Maybe we go for different things in horror. But uh, thank you to the studio for giving us the opportunity to check that out. You can get that on uh, VOD, wherever you get your VOD. Please remember to like and subscribe. Got a lot more new movie coverage, a lot more interviews, unboxings, everything coming your way. You're not going to want to miss out. Also, make sure you listen to So Wizard Podcast every single week wherever you get your podcasts. So Wizard Podcast can be found on Patreon, where for as little as $1 a month, you get multiple monthly bonus shows. SoWizardPodcast.com is your resource for reviews, recommendations, merchandise, videos, and more. We love hearing feedback, so drop a note in the comments. Leave us something on social media. All of accounts can be found after the show and in the show notes. And on a more personal note, I have an ongoing comedy comic series out right now. It's called Social Studies. It's a slice-of-life comedy comic written like a sitcom, GM through the prism of the 90s cartoons that we grew up on. Nicktoons were my biggest inspiration. Uh, totally unique art, popping colors on every page. We always go over the typical page count on a comic. No ads in between. A lot of fun to be had. The first chapter just wrapped up. We're actually putting together a uh, crowdfunding campaign right now to launch September 1st. Be on the lookout for that. It's going to be on Indiegogo to give people an opportunity to jump on Chapter 1 before Chapter 2. If you don't want to wait, you can go to socialstudiescomic.com. All seven issues available now, uh, print, digital, and also on Comixology. Comixology is a little bit behind the release date because their approval process takes so long, but I think there's four or five out right now, and all seven will be there. So check us out, socialstudiescomic.com. Thanks.